So, now let us confine our discussion with, uh, uh, so now we have discussed about Earth's magnetic field and how it is being utilized by our archaeologists in identifying a site. There is one more thing which we need to discuss about uh, uh, the geo, uh, uh, we need to discuss in geomagnetics. That is the reversal of uh, Earth's magnetic field. That we'll be doing it uh, shortly when uh, we discuss one uh, uh, absolute dating technique, paleomagnetic dating. So now, uh, after geomagnetics, uh, our archaeologists also managed to borrow one more technology once again from uh, uh, the exploration geology. That is, uh, uh, so you, using soil interface radar or ground penetrating radar. So, what do you mean by uh, radar? Radar means radio detection and the ranging. You can see radar in uh, uh, all the defense installations. You can see it uh, in an airport. You can see it in uh, uh, all the naval vessels. Correct? So, in radar, what we do? We send uh, a pulse of our radio waves, correct? And if any object comes in between, suppose if there is an object here, say some enemy missile or uh, an enemy aircraft, these radio waves gets reflected back. So then we get a you know, some object is there, some object is there in between. So it keeps uh, uh, revolving. So we get uh, the information or inputs about the objects which are approaching, which are inside the range of the radar. Radio detection under ranging. Similarly, we have soil interface or ground penetrating radar. This radar, what it will do, a pulse of this radar will be sent inside the ground. And uh, uh, it goes inside. Depending upon the objects beneath uh, uh, the surface, few objects may reflect it back. Suppose if there is a very hard uh, uh, rock here or a metal work, iron work. This may reflect it back. If there is a copper ore, this may reflect it back. On the other hand, if there are any prehistoric settlements, suppose uh, if there is a prehistoric uh, dwelling pit inside. To some extent, this is also capable of uh, for reflecting the uh, soil interface radar. The way in which uh, the waves get reflected and it comes back, right? By studying that, geologists, they are capable of uh, predicting what may be there inside. It may be a metal ore. It may be a prehistoric site. Or it may be some other thing. And uh, here they can make some predictions only. They may give us a clue. Archaeologists see we have managed to see something like this. Uh, some, some, some difference in uh, uh, the pulse of signal which returned back from the earth. Uh. So this may be a potential site. And you can explore this uh, for the possibilities. Maybe 1 in a 100 or 1 in a 50 may turn out uh, to be a good uh, prehistoric site. 
So these are the ways by which an archaeologist finds a site. Are you okay with these techniques of for finding a site? I hope you should be okay with this. First it is a pedestrian survey. In this right to minimize the distance covered or archaeologist may use a random sampling or a systematic sampling techniques. random or systematic sampling. We have also borrowed a number of techniques from exploration geology. One, by using geomagnetics. And number two, by using soil interface or ground penetration. Radar. Are you comfortable with this? Fine then. So now let us continue. So once when a site is identified, then what our archaeologists are going to do? Yeah, this is a prehistoric site. They have identified. So next is recovering the evidence from this site. So every scrap of material available here, right? need to be extracted, be it a small teeth, be it a small incisor, be it a small canine, be it a fragment of bone, be it a small broken porcelain, be it a small stone tool. Every single piece of materials right available here need to be recovered. So for that what they will do, they will again once again mark the grid. I showed you right. So this is what happening in uh, Kiradi. Kiradi, a place near uh, Madurai. See how thoroughly they are doing it. Uh, and all these labors are so skilled. Uh, and uh, these people, they have uh, decades of experience with archaeological department. Uh, they are better capable of identifying a stone tool, a fossil, etc. So they will mark it, they will make it sure that every fragment, every single fragment, right, which they have unearthed down. And they will also note down the horizontal and vertical extent because the position of an artifact in a site, right, gives a lot of information. So we will be discussing. So deeper an object is, older will be, it may be 1 million years old. If it is above that, it may not be more than 1 million years old if that site is not disturbed. Okay. So we need to recover every single fragment, every single fragment of for the remains here, every single fragment and need to be uh, need to be uh, recovered. So one should also, also within a particular, suppose if this is a one pit. If one object, one stone tool is found here. One ceramic plate is found here. 
one part uh, suppose if it has three here so they will be marking what is the horizontal extent and what is the vertical extent so what is the horizontal extent and what is the vertical extent so that uh, the position of an artifact it gives some idea how old it is we can use that for relative dating etc so every single scrap need to be recovered along with that the horizontal and the vertical extent of the artifacts should also be recorded is it so boring the thing is that uh, earlier we never used to discuss these things in length but now the pattern is shifting slightly they may focus on this area in future so these are these are the few areas which were neglected a lot in the past so that's why i'm giving lot of importance to these topics okay fine so next is uh, uh, analyzing the evidence so before even analyzing right uh, the objects which are unearthed are need to be conserved or sometimes we need to reconstruct it suppose if it is a, uh, a stone tool if it is a stone tool simply we can wash it you can use surfexal or rinse powder we can wash it clean it and we can keep it in a museum but uh, if it is uh, uh, a fossil bone and if that bone is uh, found uh, inside a limestone This is a limestone. Only part of the bone is visible outside. So now this object needs to be reconstructed and done. It needs to be conserved. So what we are supposed to do? We need to maybe doing lot of a chemical treatment, and we may separate this. Okay, there are few other objects, right? Suppose uh, if we discover a mummy. in egyptian archaeological sites we have one other number of mummies right they preserved uh, dead bodies uh, which are close to around 4000 5000 years old even in india we have uh, one such preserved mummy i have seen one in uh, the central museum in jaipur suppose next time uh, when you go to jaipur uh, try to go to the central museum there there they have kept one uh, Three thousand years old uh, mummy. So here, right now, uh, suppose if you unearth uh, such an object after uh, reconstructing it, after here we need to conserve it, and the conservation here it includes a long-term storage under a preserved condition or under a peculiar conditions. So what we need to do? We need to create. Uh, uh a glass box and within the glass box we need to make it sure there will be no big fluctuation in temperature on the uh, humidity humidity is uh, one very big enemy here it can very easily uh create some uh, microbial activity which may ruin the objects which may ruin now uh, which which may ruin the mummy okay fine so uh, conservation and reconstruction conservation right sometimes it may just be just it may just involve uh, cleaning and washing sometimes right uh, we need to do some chemical treatment uh, and sometimes right we need to store this under a preserved condition for a very long time then now uh, what we can uh, uh, understand from this thing 
by studying an artifact one can identify one can know so what are the techniques they might have used to make this tool it may be a stone tool so what are the techniques they might have used here and how they might have used it for what purpose so they have used it so all these things that we can learn from an artifact so once when uh, we unwear once when we unearth an artifact right this artifact will be subject to formal and metric analysis and metric analysis formal means uh, its form so what type of stone tool it is is it uh, a core tool or is it uh, a flake is it a flake tool so if it is uh, a core tool then metric analysis where we will be doing some measurement so what is the length what is the breadth etc so formal analysis will be subjected to formal and the metric analysis then we will classify it into typologist so stone tool bone tool ceramic under the stone tool right core tool flake tool blades burins under bone tool harpoons what is a harpoon we'll be discussing shortly needle blade here part plate cup etc so after doing this right after classifying the typologies then finally placing them we can place them into context so one very important thing finally we'll be taking you to a museum we need to place them in context means suppose if you are keeping a bow in a place in a museum we cannot keep uh, uh, ceramic plates next to this and we cannot keep uh, an uh, uh, stone tool here and the uh, the arrows meant for the bow here so placing them into context means if you keep a bow here you can arrange the arrows next to the bow if you keep ceramics you can keep it next to the parts and you can keep all the stone tools so this is what we mean by placing them in context putting them in the context so then now what we can learn from an eco fact an eco fact right gives us a lot of idea about the flora and fauna that is about the the animals and uh, the plants it helps us uh, to reconstruct the ancient environment and now we have number of uh, uh, computer generated models now along with the uh, uh, ct scans computer assisted tomography ct or cat using these right and uh, the number of biometric models
Now it is easy for an uh, archaeologist uh, to even give us idea about how the animals looked like and how they walked and how they moved and how the environment was like etc. The teeth gives us idea about uh, the type of food material on which the animal survived. Insect eaters right they have uh, sharp Nut eaters, right, they have a rounded enamel. So, like that, uh, an ecophyte gives us a lot of idea about the environment and how it looked like and how the animals were and what was the interactions going on among them. And fossils on from uh, uh, features, we can study and understand the technological sophistication their economic system, etc. Yes or no? For example, the uh, Harappan structure shows us uh, uh, a citadel, a great granary. In Lothal, we have uh, a huge dock, Lothal in Gujarat, where uh, there is a huge, huge dock, a harbor, where even you can take our modern day ship and dock, we can uh, berth it there. So, these uh, features give us idea about the technology, the economy, the great granary, right, uh, in the Harappa and Mohenjadaro and in most of the Harappan sites, right, uh, we can store, they can store food grains, uh, which is not just sufficient for the people, it is 10 times or even 20 times more than what the people can consume. So, what does it mean, why they had such a huge granary? It means the granary there uh, was not utilized uh, were not meant only for feeding the local people. They used to store food grains which they used to trade with uh, the neighbors or with the distant people. So this is what we can understand from features. So now uh, let us uh, discuss one very important topic. Very frequently we can expect a question from this topic. That is uh, uh, dating the evidence. Dating the evidence. Apparently, right now we have number of form absent for this, right? Tinder, these are like that, but certainly not that dating here. So, we are going to date the uh, or we are going to find how old an artifact is. We have another an artifact. Now, there are a number of laboratories, even in our country there are a number of laboratories uh, where we can uh, find what exactly is or how old uh, an artifact is. This is dating and evidence and there are two popular techniques in that. There are two popular techniques, one is uh, a relative dating method, another one is uh, absolute dating or chronometric dating. Absolute dating, which is also called as chronometric dating, absolute dating or chronometric dating. 
So, in the relative dating, right, if there are, so here we are not going to establish the exact age of or how exactly how old an artifact is or a fossil is. We are just going to compare only, we are just going to compare two objects or two artifacts or two fossils or two. So, how old one is, which one is older, which one is newer, that is relative dating. In absolute or, uh, or chronometric dating, with lot of accuracy, we are going to establish how old an artifact is. How old an artifact is. Okay. So, first let us discuss few relative dating techniques. Uh, the very popular and uh, uh, the very important technique here is and it is in fact the oldest one is uh, stratigraphy. Stratigraphy. Okay. That means if uh, we dig a site, one uh, uh, stone tool is there. Say a Coolian hand axe. So we use the term a Coolian because for the first time this type of stone tools, this type of hand axe was discovered from a Coolis in France. And this stone tool was very common during Paleolithic period. We will discuss in length about a Coolian hand axe soon. Okay. And uh, uh, one flake tool. So, stratigraphy here. The oldest sides will generally be deeper. So, here Aculian hand axe is older, it is more primitive than Clactonian flakes. This is stratigraphy. That is it, very simple. Sometimes right in stratigraphy, we also use uh, an indicator fossil. So, indicator fossils are generally we use it for um, uh, relatively new finds like uh, suppose if it is less than 1 million or if it is less than uh, uh, 2 million years old right. Uh, we can use this indicator fossils uh, to find exactly how old uh, uh, this object, which one is older or which one is newer etc. I will tell you uh, what this indicator fossils are. So, indicator fossils means uh, these are animals which lived in the past and which lived there only for a short period of time and it became extinct or it might have got evolved into some other species. This we call it as indicator fossil. One good example is uh, straight tusked elephant. I will show you the straight tusked elephant. This is a straight tusked elephant. You can see the hairs here, right? Earlier in ecological anthropology, we have discussed that, that these are adaptation to live under cold condition. Yes, even this is uh, this we call it as uh, a Pleistocene megafauna.
that means large sized animals which lived during the pleistocene period so we know that pleistocene period was gripped by a cold ice age a very cold ice age to protect themselves against the cold these animals become larger because there is a large scale accumulation of, of fat in their body there is a large scale accumulation of, of fat in their body so they became very large and gigantic proportion the most important being uh, the straight tusked elephant siberian mammoth woolly rhinoceros giant uh, reindeer etc but these animals lived only for a short period of time for less than uh, 50000 years and it vanished once when uh, the cold ice age of the pleistocene period disappeared even this animal even this animals disappeared these are called as indicator fossils so in stratigraphy we also use indicator fossils to identify or to relate the age of the new finds be it an artifact or in fossil which are less than 2 million years old okay sorry okay with the term indicator fossils indicator fossils means these are fossils these are animals or plants which lived for a short duration of time in the past and which got evolved into some other species or which became extinct shortly okay done so stratigraphy so in stratigraphy deeper an object is older it will be but we cannot use stratigraphy as a, uh, a tool of relative dating if uh, that site is disturbed the site is disturbed okay so next important uh, uh, relative dating technique F U N Prio is nothing but fluorine, uranium, and uh, uh, nitrogen trio, fluorine, uranium, and uh, a nitrogen trio see here if somebody dies and die, if he gets buried our body contains uh, nitrogen abundant abundant nitrogen where do we have nitrogen in our body all the amino acids in our body right is composed of is made of nitrogen then uh, our dna our dna in our cells right these are composed of these are made up of for nitrogenous bases four important nitrogenous bases adenine thymine adenine thymine guanine cytosine and even now in rna we have uracil do not worry kavita madam will discuss in length about uh, this nitrogenous bases and how these are combined to form uh, dna etc so within our cell in our dna we have uh, nitrogen the amino acids in our body are composed of nitrogen so we have abundant nitrogen in our body so once a person dies right the nitrogen content in his body slowly he will start on losing the nitrogen nitrogen will suppose if this is of the system nitrogen will slowly he will start losing nitrogen from the body on the other hand we do not have uh, uh, fluorine and uranium in our body 
we don't have uranium in our body we don't have fluorine in our body but uh, the running water contains the fluorine and the uh, uranium uranium is present in running water in traces only thing is uh, we cannot extract this uranium to use it uh, uh, in our nuclear reactors but at microscopic level right uranium is there in uh, uh, uranium is there everywhere so we do not have uranium initially but uranium will be there uh, in this environment in this environment so uranium and the fluorine gets added into your body over time so with passage of time more and more uranium more and more fluorine will get accumulated into a dead fossil while there will be a general decay of or uh, loss of nitrogen from that fossil so if suppose uh, the area there is uh, uh, there are two fossils fossil a fossil b for fossil a so uranium content is uh, uh, 10 units fluorine content is uh, uh, 8 units and nitrogen content is uh, uh, 40 units if for b uranium content is uh, 16 unit fluorine content is uh, 12 unit nitrogen content is uh, 30 units in very easily you can say a is older than b i'm sorry because both are there within the same environment here b managed to accumulate more uranium on the fluorine from the environment because it was there for a long time on the other hand a couldn't accommodate a couldn't accumulate too much of uh, uh, uranium on the fluorine because it was there relatively for uh, a small period of time when compared to b that's why even now uh, our nitrogen content is a bit high here they said to lose but still but see here we managed to erode lot of nitrogen from its uh, from its body so b is older a is uh, the newer if both of them are lie adjacent to each other say the gap between them is uh, uh, 2 meters we can use f u n trio to date uh, these two fossils on the other hand if there are two fossils one is in delhi there is another fossil here this is in uh, patna we cannot use f u n trio to do relative dating of these two fossils because the fluorine uranium accumulated into this body right it depends upon the availability of fluorine on the uranium in this region for example let this be a let this be b for a fluorine content may be 10 units uranium content may be 12 units but uh, for this one right for b fluorine content may be 20 units uranium content may be 30 units 
but still A may be older than B because the amount of fluorine and uranium trapped by this right it depends upon the fluorine and uranium present in the respective area. Suppose if in this environment, if suppose if in this environment, if the fluorine and uranium content in the environment is very high or here if it is very low and here if it is very high, we cannot compare the two different fossils here. Got it? So, FUN trio cannot be used to do relative dating of two fossils which are separated by greater distance because the amount of fluorine and uranium accumulated by a fossil right depends upon the fluorine and uranium available in that given environment. So, this can be used to date two fossils which are found in one single environment which are placed very close to each other very close to each other. Got it? So, these are the two important relative dating techniques. One is stratigraphy, another one is F, U, N, Trio. Got it? So, next let us discuss the absolute dating or chronometric dating techniques. So, remember absolute dating is also called as chronometric. Sometimes, right, you may find, you may spend all your energy to read what is, all your energy to read these uh, absolute dating techniques. In your examination, if they ask you to write about a chronometric dating, and if you do not know that is this, it happened actually once, it happened once. It happened uh, in one state service commission examination where uh, there was one question about uh, uh, Harappan civilization and that is a compulsory question, Indus Valley civilization. See. Uh, Only one or two out of a few hundred students, right, managed to write an answer for that. How it is possible for our examiner to ask such a tough question about Harappan civilization? Because from our childhood days, right, from our school level, we keep reading about Harappan civilization. At least, right, somebody will be in a position to write about the town planning, central drainage system, um, house made of a burnt bricks, the great bath of Mohanjadaro, the great granary, something will be in a position to write, right? But why, why nobody could answer that? Because it was an indirect question. They asked, uh, the examiner asked to write them about uh, proto-history, write a brief note on the proto-history of India. Everyone know about uh, Harappan civilization, everyone know about uh, Harappan, Mohanjadaro, Lothal, Kalibangan, etc. But they need to know that uh, that is uh, that belongs to the proto history of India because they had no clue about what the term proto, proto history is. Most of them missed uh, Most of them couldn't manage to attempt that question. So that's why I'm saying absolute dating techniques are also called as chronometric dating. Also called as chronometric dating. So, now let us discuss a few important uh, chronometric, there are number of techniques, uh, uh, I will discuss some few, few techniques, few very important techniques, okay. Uh, the first one important, first important thing being radiocarbon dating. Radiocarbon dating, 14C and radioactive form of a carbon, an isotope of carbon this is, and this radioactive form of this C14, right, this is not found naturally. These are actually created in the atmosphere 
when uh, our solar photons react with the uh, 14 nitrogen 14 nitrogen plus the solar photons the interaction right creates 14c so the 14c are produced in the atmosphere and this 14c right these are absorbed by our plants Plants absorb this 14C and animals eat the plant, right? Animals eat the plant. So, 14C manage to enter the animals through this process radioactive form of see this is the isotope of carbon c14 right it's an isotope of carbon the c4 the c14 isotopes are produced in the atmosphere by an interaction of this 14 n nitrogen and solar photons this will be absorbed, plants readily absorb this 14, 14 C. And when animals eat the plants, this radioactive form of carbon, 14 C, enters into the system. And once when an animal dies, once when an animal dies, no more it can take this radiocarbon. That's all. After that, it cannot take the radiocarbon inside. This radiocarbon writes when it is afresh, when it is formed afresh in an environment, this radio this emits some beta radiations. A fresh radioactive form of carbon right, it emits so close to around. 15 beta radiations per second, sorry, per minute. So, slowly these, right, this radiocarbon starts uh, decaying. It starts decaying into some other uh, uh, chemicals. Some other chemicals. So, with the passage of time, with the passage of time, the capacity of uh, this radioactive form of uh, or the C14 to emit beta radiations uh, decreases. When half of the radio, when half of the C14 gets consumed, right? Suppose uh, if there are 10 units. If half of things are get reduced, then it will not be in a position to emit 15 beta radiations in a minute. It can emit 15 beta radiations in 2 minutes or 7.5, we cannot divide it off right 7.5 per minute. The half-life of uh, radioactive form of carbon right, is known actually. It takes 5730 years for half of uh, the radiocarbon to decompose. Okay. And suppose if they have taken some other uh, sample where uh, the 14C in this right, if it emits uh, 15 beta radiations in 4 minutes. In 4 minutes. Or, or some 3.75 in 1 minute. It means this sample should be 11,400 
అండ్ సిక్స్టీ ఇయర్స్ ఓల్డ్ గట్ ఇట్ నో కెన్ యూ అండర్స్టాండ్ సో ఫ్రెష్ వాన్ ఎమిట్స్ ఫిఫ్టీన్ బీటా రేడియేషన్స్ పర్ మినిట్ అండ్ సపోజ్ ఇఫ్ ఇట్ ఈస్ ఫైవ్ థౌజండ్ సెవెన్ హండ్రెడ్ అండ్ థర్టీ ఇయర్స్ ఓల్డ్ దిస్ విల్ ఎమిట్ ఫిఫ్టీన్ బీటా రేడియేషన్ ఇన్ టూ మినిట్స్ ఇఫ్ అన్ ఆబ్జెక్ట్ ఈస్ లెవెన్ థౌజండ్ ఫోర్ హండ్రెడ్ అండ్ సిక్స్టీ ఇయర్స్ ఓల్డ్ ఫి ఫాజల్ ఈస్ ఇట్ విల్ ఎమిట్ ఫిఫ్టీన్ బీటా రేడియేషన్ ఇన్ ఫోర్ మినిట్స్ ఫోర్ మినిట్స్ ఇఫ్ అన్ ఆబ్జెక్ట్ ఈస్ ట్వంటీ టూ థౌజండ్ ఎయిట్ సారీ నైన్ హండ్రెడ్ ఆన్ ట్వంటీ ఇయర్స్ ఓల్డ్ ఇట్ విల్ ఎమిట్ ఫిఫ్టీ బీటా రేడియేషన్ ఇన్ ఎయిట్ మినిట్స్ ఇన్ ఎయిట్ మినిట్స్ ఓకే సో లైక్ దట్ ఇట్ కీప్స్ గోయింగ్ ఆన్ సో యూసింగ్ దిస్ టెక్నిక్స్ వాట్ దే విల్ డూ దే విల్ టేక్ సపోజ్ ఇఫ్ దే హ్యావ్ వాట్ డిస్కవర్ ద యా ఫాజిల్ they will take a small bone sample and they will analyze how much beta radiations are coming out through that right they will be in a position to find the exact date of this fossil this technique is called as radiocarbon dating and we can use this sample to date fossils up to which are 50,000 years old. ఫిఫ్టీ years old. ఇయర్స్ ఓల్డ్ ఐ టోల్డ్ యూ అబౌట్ ఓన్ డిస్కవరీ ఫ్రమ్ కీడడి కీడడి దట్ ఈస్ వన్ వర్డ్ యూస్డ్ ఇన్ తమిళ్ అండ్ మలయాళం ra we need to fold the tongue to say ra ra kiradi 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 not kiladi kiradi okay fine so next uh, so uh, the objects discovered in from kiladi right uh, they were subjected to radiocarbon dating to identify the exact age of uh, uh, how old that those objects are so next uh, i will discuss thermoluminescence dating thermoluminescence heat light thermoluminescence of dating <coughs> i think guys uh, this lecture i hope uh, you are finding it uh, bit very boring hopefully so relax watch it two three times see so generally right uh, most of uh, uh, the people who teach anthropology they'll skip these topics because uh, uh, generally they never used to ask uh, these things uh, in length but nowadays right because of because of the need now because things are becoming very competitive and uh, there is all it's always challenging both for the examiner as well as for the student it's very much challenging for the examiner to set a tough paper so when every year when they keep thinking about making things tough tough and tougher there are always chances that they may venture deep into these topics that's why we have discussed us uh, slowly in length about uh, the principles involved in uh, prehistoric archaeology what is an artifact what is an eco fact what is a fossil what is a feature what is a site how sites are formed and how archaeologists talk go and identify a site 
So what do you mean by pedestrian survey? In that what exactly you mean by systematic sampling or random sampling? What do you mean by geomagnetics? What do you mean by soil interface radar? There is a need actually. That's why right, we discuss all these things so slowly, leisurely in length. And along with that, right, as we are providing you uh, this printed form, uh, there is no need for you to write things and uh, waste your time also. And in fact, uh, this gives me a lot of luxury. I can just speak a lot of story to make things, uh, easy, to make uh, you understand things in an easier way. And keep one thing in mind. Keep one thing in mind. Every single word which I speak here, right, uh, are related to your subject. I am not just seeing some or uh, speaking some random stories here and there. So every single story or every single thing which I speak here right now, the aim is uh, to make you to understand the subject so easy. So always keep this in mind. Always keep this in mind. So proper listening to what we are discussing here that alone will serve the number of purpose. So, about this thermal luminescence dating, better uh, let us discuss it uh, in our next lecture. So, we need to discuss thermal luminescence dating, electron spin resonance dating, then paleomagnetic dating. After that, still we have uh, uh, potassium argon dating, uh, uranium series dating, fission track dating, but there is no need to go that depth actually. So, those things that I will just brief you, I will explain you only, see, after this, right, let us discuss in length uh, electron spin resonance dating and paleomagnetic dating. Then after that, I will discuss with you uh, uranium series dating. Uranium series, how uranium gets converted into thorium and how that can be utilized uh, for dating uh, uh, the fossils. Even potassium argon dating is a very important technique because uh, most of the fossils discovered in uh, East Africa were uh, dated using these techniques. And let me, let me tell you one more thing also, see, if you are not able to understand few things, if you are capable of by hurting those things, right, please do it. Everything, right, we cannot understand and we cannot uh, keep in our head. Few things, right, if you are not in a position to understand, just by heart it and forget it. At the examination level, the examiner is not going to check whether you are retaining this, whether you have understood the concepts properly or not. Got it? Okay, so today let us uh, wind up our session with this and uh, tomorrow let us uh, continue our discussion in this thing where we will finish the uh, dating techniques. Then I will start discussing Paleolithic culture. That is something very important and very interesting. Okay, so until then, thank you. Have a great day.